Morning, Trevor, and it's a pleasure to be on your new show. Um, what I can tell you is that the moment the Education Secretary has heard about any problem in a school, any risk to children, uh, she has acted. And we have uh, 22,000 schools in the country, and there has been, since that incident, a huge programme going through this, this rack asbestos issue because we want to be absolutely sure that every child is safe and we have then made sure as soon as we have information of any risk that uh, something is done to mitigate that risk. So by the way just to pick this up it's not just rack we're worried about now is it it's asbestos and that expands the potential number of schools greatly doesn't it? Well um it doesn't matter if it's uh, RAC or the wider asbestos issue. Um, this particular uh, recent information we had covers 156 schools. A third of those we've been able to make uh, mitigations immediately so that they're able to operate. And the majority of the remaining 100 or so, uh, they're able to operate largely normally. But we will continue this programme because we want to make sure at every stage that schools are safe and we will prioritise investment by but the if government, I may say so, the which point, is my job as Chancellor. But the point is, it, do, it does make it different because we're talking now about a different scale of problem. Not 150 schools, but we may be talking about hundreds and some people this morning are talking about thousands. If you include what we know about asbestos... Uh, so the issue of identifying the risk is very important. Can you say to a parent who has to send their child to school tomorrow that they can be confident, if they haven't been told that there's a risk, that their child will be safe? Well, we are doing everything we can to make sure that is the case. We can absolutely promise that uh, the government will take action immediately when we know there is any kind of risk, but also, more broadly, in terms of my decisions as Chancellor, uh, that we will prioritise spending money to sort out these problems where that needs to happen. And in my first autumn statement, uh, we announced an extra £2.3 billion pounds yep. for schools. That was in a context of having to cut back public spending in other areas, so we are absolutely... Uh, right. committed to doing what it takes to make sure our schools are safe. Forgive me for pressing on this, but what you've said so far adds up to a simple statement. You don't know. You don't know how many schools, you don't know how many courts, you don't know how many hospitals, and worst of all, you don't know which ones. I think you owe it to the public simply to sometimes say, we just don't know. I, I don't think that's a fair characterisation, Trevor, of what's been happening. Well, you uh, can't tell me that you do know. You haven't well, told me what well, numbers. I, I'm, I'm telling you that what the government has been doing is an exhaustive programme of contacting every school to try and identify where the risk is and acting immediately we find the information. Now, obviously, we might find new information uh, in, in the weeks or months ahead. We will act on it. But uh, in terms of the information that we have in front of us to date, uh, we have acted immediately. We will continue to act. We will continue to invest. This is a problem that dates right the way back to yeah. the 1980s, and yeah. we will do what it takes but to make sure that the children this, are safe. The reason this matters is it's a matter of trust in government. And if we look at the record, uh, it doesn't inspire. Your fellow ministers were told about this risk more than a decade ago. Uh, when you launched, uh, in fact, you cancelled some of the schools building programme, you were told again about the urgency of it after the single well incident in 2018. I think that is just wrong. Um, the Building Schools for the Future programme uh, was uh, changed, and it was changed in order to reduce the cost of building more schools so that we could spend more money on repairs to the schools, the estate we had. Um, in 2019, when Rishi Sunak was Prime Minister, he dramatically increased the capital budget across yes. government, um, which showed our commitment to uh, the public estate. When I was okay. Chancellor, I protected those increases in cash terms. So we're absolutely committed yeah, to investing in the public realm. Well, I, th uh, I don't okay. think you can say that, Trevor, with respect. Um, as soon as problems have been identified, we started a huge survey of 
every single school in the country uh, so we could identify where these problems are. And I think okay. it's very important to reassure parents that where there is an issue, as soon as we find out about it, we will act. All right, just a very quick point for head teachers: If they have to spend money on rentals and so on, you're going to guarantee they'll get the extra money for that? We will make sure that they can keep their children safe. OK, let's uh, talk about Tata Steel. Um, what exactly is the government's plan here? Is it right that uh, you will promise the £500 million that they want uh, to create uh, a new green steel uh, industry in Patalbot? Well, there are some sensitive commercial negotiations okay. going on at the moment, so I, I can't divulge what those are, but let me give you the bigger picture uh, which perhaps gives you a sense of direction of travel. Um, we are absolutely committed to uh, manufacturing, uh, to advanced manufacturing. It's one of our five priority sectors. Uh, the UK is one of the world's top ten manufacturers. A lot of people don't know that. And what we've learned in uh, the pandemic and in the Ukraine crisis is the importance of supply chains. And we need steel to be manufactured in this country. We need it for our automotive industry, you know, big new move towards electric cars. Uh, we also need it for wind turbines, for all these things. So we are committed to manufacturing steel in this country. Um, but we want to have sustainable steel, green steel, as you say, and that's why we're having discussions with all the relevant manufacturers to see how we can plot that part. So your aim is to keep a steel industry afloat, even though you know, in truth, we can't compete with what's coming from China. I, I wonder if some of your colleagues um, in the Conservative Party might say, when the Prime Minister talked about Brexit freedom, did he mean the freedom to prop up an industry that can't compete with China and to hand over half a billion quid to a global conglomerate, Tata? Well, I I'm sorry, Trevor, I think you're being very uh, negative and declinist about Britain. We can certainly compete with China. We are um, the world's second largest I'm just joining offshore, some of wind, your colleagues on offshore this. wind producer. And when it comes to high-end manufacturing, uh, as opposed to the very low-cost manufacturing, we have uh, four of the world's top ten universities, amazing research and development happening here. OK. Um, and we have um, a British economy that is a global leader when it comes to life sciences, technology, right. advanced manufacturing. So I, we, uh, I just reject, if I may, uh, and I know you don't okay. want to be totally gloomy in your very first show, but um, uh, well, I hope you will allow me to correct you. I okay. think we have got great potential uh, as an economy. OK, let, 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 me, let me back off my miserabilism and let's talk about the economy. Um, you've had some good news this week. Um, the economy is not as widely thought, smaller than pre-pandemic uh, levels. It's been doing better than supposed since 2021. Let me ask you this. Had you known this 11 months ago, would you have made different decisions? No, because the decisions we took were primarily because we had to bring inflation down, which peaked at over 11%, uh, a series of incredibly difficult decisions uh, that Rishi Sunak and I took uh, because we knew that until you get inflation down, you can't end the misery for families who see the cost of their weekly shop going up, the cost of their uh, filling up their tank of petrol, they see that going up as well, and that was an absolute priority for us. But, but you're right to talk about these figures, because um, what they actually show is that of the largest European countries, the UK has been the most successful at growing back after the pandemic. Um, that 0.6% increase on pre-pandemic GDP is higher than France, higher than Germany, higher than Italy, also higher than Japan. Yeah. That happened because Rishi Sunak, as Chancellor, okay. took decisions like the furlough okay. scheme, uh, like the bounce-back um, loans, which were more generous than other countries, and that is why we've been able to protect that out. OK, I wanted to give you time to do the, the, the ad, and it's, 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 perfectly ad, fair, it is... it's perfectly fair for you to make this point, but I, I, I want to refer you to some other figures. Let's have a look at debt. Uh, I've got a graph here. Um, our debt to GDP ratio, it's a measure, as you know, of uh, how uh, our debt burden as a country. And I just want to take you back. 1941, obviously war, huge debt. 2021, we're nearly 100% uh, 
uh, debt to GDP, that is higher than at any time in your lifetime. You're born in 66, right? The last time uh, we were at this level was 61. That's not a really uh, an achievement to be proud of, is it? Well, I'm really pleased you mentioned that, Trevor. <laughs> I really am, because um, no Conservative government believes that it is sustainable to have debt on this scale, and we also think it's morally wrong, because what you're actually doing is spending today and passing on uh, the, the bill for that to future generations. And that's why one of the Prime Minister's five pledges but... is to reduce that. Let me finish, because I, okay, right, okay. so I want to tell you what I've done. So the decisions I took in the autumn statement and the spring budget mean that debt is £54 billion lower than it would otherwise have been. Uh, we have a, a fiscal rule that says that we need to prioritise reducing debt, and we will continue to do that. And, you know, that is the choice because uh, the Labour Party is saying that in the next Parliament they want to increase borrowing by £100 billion. Pounds. Yeah. That means that debt is going to be higher. OK. And it also means that interest rates are going to be higher, which okay. means the pain for people with mortgages it, is going to go on for longer. It, it's early on Sunday morning, so I don't want to get too nerdy about uh, the levels of debt. Some of that may be your responsibility, but some of it... To be honest, the uh, debt figures that you've had uh, were not necessarily your own responsibility. But I want to take up the point that you made about uh, passing on debt to our children and grandchildren. The Office for Budget Responsibility says that the debt uh, ratio will fall to a low of 88% by mid-2030s, but it's going to soar to 310% by the mid 2070s because of climate change, defence and ageing population. Um, are you simply storing up banana republic levels of debt for our grandchildren? No. And how do you deal with that issue? There are two ways. Uh, firstly, you have to grow the economy so that the, the, your GDP is bigger and you're able to manage uh, the same level of debt as a lower proportion of your overall cost. That is very important for people's taxes, and people are finding their taxes are very high as we have high debt interest. But the second thing you have to do is to run the public sector more efficiently. And when we uh, got to the pandemic for completely... More cuts. No, not more cuts. That's exactly my point, actually. When we got to the pandemic for completely understandable reasons, the public service reform agenda was halted... Uh, we now need to restart that. How do we run the public sector more efficiently without affecting the frontline services yeah. that people experience? Well, we need to look at the fact that police officers spend far too long on admin. Uh, Some teachers okay. spend more than half their time yep. uh, on non-teaching tasks. Doctors, nurses spend far too much time on admin. Okay. That's why I have written uh, right. today to all my secretaries of state responsible for those areas to say, all right. what is the amount of time spent on that? All right. What can we do to reduce it? Before you um, go, I, I want to ask you about the process of government itself. You've been lucky. You, you know, you've been in your job for a while. I, I want to show you something else. You, you built a very successful business, actually, so you know how to run organisations. You created a stable team. Here is Cabinet turnover since the 2019 general elections. Housing, big priority. There have been seven housing ministers. Um, and then let's have a look at the jobs that your colleagues have done. Uh, I've got another slide here. Here's the league table. One cabinet minister, who's not even in the cabinet anymore, had nine jobs. Um, this is a higher turnover than even a Premier League Manage, you and I support the same team, Chelsea. I mean, a Chelsea manager feels safer than a cabinet minister. This is no way to run a wealth stall, isn't it? Never mind a government. Well, we have had turbulence. Um, oh, come on. Let, let me finish. Nine jobs. Well, let me, let me answer your question, Trevor. We have had turbulence caused by things like pandemic, uh, like, you know, big changes in our economic that... model. Caused... Let, me, let me answer the question. <laughs> okay. um, I know it's your very first show, but let me answer the question. <laughs> but what I would say is that since Rishi Sunak has become Prime Minister, that has changed, and he has made only the most limited changes. The most recent change to the Defence Secretary was caused by a personal decision by Ben Wallace to step down. And what Rishi Sunak is interested in is not the personalities, but who is going to get the job done. And when people get the job done, he backs them.
Chancellor, I hope that I will have the opportunity, because you will still be in your job for the next 12 months, to talk to you again about this. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Trevor.